Hello and welcome to the Airline Business Podcast, discussing key news and trends in the global airline sector. This time, more carriers in trouble, overall profits are down, but the outlook for airlines in 2020 is surprisingly bright. We look back at 2019, the year ahead, and as we say goodbye to the 2010s, we look at the defining issues that have shaped the past decade. My name's Graham Dunn. I'm joined by my airline business colleague, Lewis Harper. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? Yeah, good. And uh, uh, for this, what is a very special festive airline business podcast. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I imagine you we'll be adding some sound effects, maybe. I very much so. I think <laughs> you will have noticed that. And, uh, and, and fair play, Lewis, you've come... In the full Father Christmas <laughs> outfit, I didn't really uh, no. think you'd do that. I no, well, just I had to normal... outdo you. So yes, yeah, I went full Father Christmas, not just the beard and the hat <laughs> that you've uh, you've adopted. So uh, yes, yeah. so so you know that's our that's our concession to the concession <laughs> to the to the festive flavour is mm. um, you can imagine, that, and obviously we are uh, yeah. in um, full. <laughs> Um, Christmas uh, outfit, and we got some uh, some bells <laughs> on the music. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you get to this end of end of year period, and it's always an interesting period because there's a, there's a, you start there's a bit of reflection. And uh, this last week, uh, uh, I was in Geneva when IATA, mm. which is the Global Airline Association, uh, produced its outlook for how it saw airline financials going, and broadly, it's. It, well, it's a fu- it's a funny period. Yeah, because yeah, we always, um, yeah, we're, particularly in Europe, we get a lot of we've had a lot of carriers falling over. But at the same time, you, you sometimes can lose sight of the the bigger picture, which is actually you know we're, we're not at the record profit levels of two or three years ago, but we are. It's still a pre- overall a pretty strong strong industry, and there's a possibility things might be looking looking up as well. Yeah. Going into the next year, which was an interesting development, I think, I, in the IATA. I thought that was meeting. the most the most interesting thing. I mean, IATA, they it, it's not an easy thing. They put they they make their they make their first forecast or outlook of what the industry as a whole would make as in a net profit. And mm. um, this time last year, they were looking at they thought oh, probably about thirty five billion, which which is a lot of money. It's still um, mm. uh, uh, you know historically quite high. It wouldn't quite have been a peak, but. And then by mid-year, they had already wiped that off by about a fifth, which was really around um, the yield environment, the demand environment. You know, I think what's most interesting in, in their outlook is, is is then compare what they thought six months ago. So their last outlook was in, in June. Mm. This one, um, they shaved another two billion off it. So it's uh, 25.8 billion, I think, is the, is the collective amount, which is still, you know, as, as you say, Lewis, is, is still historically pretty good mm. for for the for the industry but it was clear that, the, that they thought this year was was tougher than anyone first anticipated mm. yeah and you've seen in some of those yeah you, you talked about some factors another one is obviously the on the cargo side of things not a huge deal for for every airline but certainly for a lot and we've seen the the trade tensions between china and the u.s particularly really hit that area hard so yeah there have been some challenges and i think um but in a lot of those, I think there's a sense that in 2020, some of them could be relieved and, and that's going to make it interesting. We don't know. We could be here in a year's time and IATA are um, revising their, um, I don't know if that was De Juniac there, pointing <laughs> out, changing his, uh, <laughs> changing his, uh, changing his outlook as yeah. we speak. But yeah, certainly on, on 2020, some of those, those things could could resolve a bit. Uh, we could be, as I was about to say, we could be here in a year's time. And again, IATA has, has downgraded its forecast. But but there there does seem to be some logic in some of the things I was saying about it, uh, yeah it, some areas where it could get better. It is, it is definitely interesting. I think the way they sort of view it is, or the, or the the commentary that went around it is that it's, this year was much worse than they thought, mm. or airlines would have expected, and and partly because it's been that much worse. Actually, at a at a macro economic level, governments, fiscal policy, and various countries, mm. people have actually done stuff to to address that. So, mm. so actually, you know, global GDP, which is like a is, is a huge driver for airline demand, um, that was lower than the IMF had originally projected. But because of those fiscal policies, actually, it's projected to be better for next year. So, mm. it, to some extent, it's a slightly old-fashioned uh, projection because uh, you know i think what we've seen 
uh, in the industry over this over the last four or five years. There's lots of one-off factors which are, which are impacting it, whether that's mm. fuel price in particular, you know, massive movements in fuel prices or currency. Um, and actually, the, in- the industry has always been a bit prone to whether it's the ash cloud, you know, disruption mm. impacting stuff. But at its roots, you have it's it, you know historically and our profits would follow the economic cycle up and down mm. up you know as it went and this forecast is a bit in line with that it is that next year airlines should do quite well because the economic impact is uh, economic projections are mm. slightly better there seems to be some general view that there'll be stability around fuel prices which we haven't seen for some time mm. um, and in that environment things should broadly be better better for airlines yeah no, no, I, I was at um, in brussels last week and um caught up with michael o'leary and um obviously an interesting story on um looking into 2020 i think he seemed to share that idea that things could be getting better they've obviously um been again <laughs> we talk about them being hit by something but they are still producing mm. pretty impressive profits but but certainly on the um yield side that and they don't like to talk about yield but but uh certainly that's been a challenge for them fares have been at rock bottom um and i think he he certainly had a sense that again on the theme that things that played out in 2019 are likely to make things better in 2020 so he talked about norwegian um, cutting 22 23 percent of their um, intra-European capacity, the airlines collapsing. Unfortunately, they're obviously a tough for a lot of people, but but then they tend to strengthen the, the, those that remain. So obviously Thomas Cook, etc. And what that's done is, um, again, talking specifically about Europe, but we've got a, a situation where there's a lot of fears about overcapacity, a flood of planes coming to the market. And actually, O'Leary was saying he he reckons next year capacity-wise, uh, intra. European anyway, you're probably looking at something flat or even a slight reduction. And at the same time, he, again, no one can be sure on the fuel prices, mm. but he was very much saying at the moment it could look like you have a the combination of a sort of a very helpful moderation of capacity and a very helpful fuel price mm. in 2020. Now, again, obviously, we could be sitting here in a year's time and, and that hasn't happened. But, but certainly... Um, the, the the he echoes that kind of mm. thing you got from Iata, even though he's obviously from a very different area of, <laughs> of the uh, sector than than, than the Iata, um carriers. So I think that again, I think that adds to this narrative that's building up that we could it, be looking up. It yeah. is interesting, and, and and capacity is very interesting. That there are a couple of ele- elements to it because one of the things about this year, capacity being down there, the airlines have taken sort of quite a proactive view in in um, tackling their capacity and you particularly in Europe I think you have seen um, airlines very quick to respond in terms of um, in not uh, you know when the, the old environment was looking a bit uh, dicey you know much much quicker in responding taking probably stronger action than you'd historically seen in, in terms of curbing that capacity um, but also, of course, there's this added factor of um, the grounding of the MAX, mm. which has also taken some capacity out. Now, at the press conference when I asked, if they, um, <laughs> they were asked repeatedly about the MAX, yeah. the impact yeah. on it. And they're sort of quite upfront about, you know, it's really difficult to actually untangle what impact that has. And mm. you can, I think you can argue it both ways. You can, you know, on the face of it, there's X number of aircraft that aren't coming in. That has kind of reduced some capacity out there. Mm. Uh, that maybe has helped airlines in, in in that yield environment. But at the same time, air, airlines still had to fly capacity, and some of those aircraft would have been replacing less fuel efficient aircraft. Yeah. Some of those they would have had to brought in, bring in some capacity to cover it. Mm. Um, so it's, so it's an intriguing mix. And it's very difficult to be able to specifically say whether capacity mm. got bigger or better, uh, whether that helped or not, something like the, ma- the max. And I think the other interesting element around capacity is for next year is, obviously, we don't quite know when, um, but assuming that the, the max comes back into service, mm. on top of that, you have an already high level of delivery scheduled for next year. Mm. Um, so, you know, I asked assess about, you know, one thing they said was probably the biggest unknown for next year is the impact this capacity will have and yeah. it's interesting in different in Europe the 
the thought is that airlines will remain quite watchful on it. But in the US, maybe um, we will see um, uh, that extra capacity come in. Yeah, because we've seen, yeah, it's very much yeah, different different kind of ways that will play out in the different regions. You're right on, on Europe. You've seen Ryanair, again, um, say on the max, that if they don't have their first delivery by the time they're getting into the kind of real meat of the summer season, they won't want them delivered then. So because they're, they're, there's obviously quite a big deal introducing this new aircraft type to your fleet, you want to do it when you've got time to, to do it properly. So uh, there are all sorts of factors. And as, as we do edge towards the max, you know, now airlines are talking about them coming in April, May sort of time at best. Those sorts of considerations come into play. But certainly we don't see that possibly quite the same narrative coming from the bigger US mm. carriers, for example. You look at their their recent you know, financial reporting and it's pretty impressive profit-wise. We always point out that when you talk about the global um, profits for the whole airline industry, the US, big US carriers tend to contribute quite heavily to that. And they're, I think they're pretty bullish. They're looking at... Um, they've been cautious on capacity in some cases, but not in others. Obviously, United has been mm. a bit more uh, a max operator has been um, um, upping its capacity domestically, for example. So um, one thing's for sure it's, is there's no one-size-fits-all answer with the, the max coming back into service. But it is um, an unknown, and, um, and it'll be fascinating to see it play out. And the, and, and the other element that plays into to capacity within Europe is actually the, the whole environmental issue, which is you know, a much stronger, we've seen even more um, weight added to, to that argument over the second half of this, this year in particular. Mm. And one of the interesting, you know, how does that reflect within Europe? Yeah, there's a view that actually that in Europe, that kind of pressure, the, the, the wanting to address those issues, means that the capacity coming into Europe is more likely to be replacement Mm. So that the newer types using uh, coming in to replace capacity, uh, existing older types, mm. and you may not see that factor um, quite so prevalent in other regions. No, that's right. Um, I think the last point around which uh, which you mentioned earlier around that financial outlook is is it is such an odd picture or mixed picture because you have you know at a headline level. Good profits. You have airlines all report. You know a lot of airlines reporting. You know twenty, thirty airlines reporting really decent, strong figures. Mm. Um, but throughout the year, it's been punctuated by these airline airlines in trouble. Airlines yeah. on the on the verge of collapse of one form or requiring restructuring. And again, we've seen Alitalia, South African Airways, um, H and A, not H and A, Hong Kong Airlines. Yeah. Through, you know all there are individual factors behind all those airlines mm. which have caused challenges which have caused them to go into some kind of restructuring or require that yeah. uh, you know very local to their specific issues mm. but that's been you know you've seen that picture across the year yeah. we've seen it whether that's with Jet Airways with some of the European carriers that fell away Avianca Brazil mm. it's been a constant theme so you have a very mixed picture that airlines are generally enjoying a nice yeah. headline profit level but at, um, yeah, we talked about a lot, I think, a couple of years ago. Where if airlines aren't doing well now, then mm. what's going to happen when it even dips slightly? And and we've seen, yeah, quite significant, as you talk about, but, you know, big, relatively large players like South Africa really struggling. In some cases, obviously, they're, they're government backed, so we, they, you know, who knows if they'll actually be allowed to fall over or how far any. Valitalia mm. yeah, is another example, you know, they, 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 um, they probably do need to emerge with a radically different model, but whether that actually happens, and we'll, again in ten years' time, they'll still be kind of, we'll still be wondering what um, what their future holds. But um, but but certainly, yeah, it's um, it, it's played out in that way. What I guess the again, if we get a, an uplift going into twenty twenty, of carriers uh, feel a relief on some of those pressures. Where the question is, will we perhaps get towards the end of the year and not be talking about quite so many carriers struggling going into the winter season because the summer season has been slightly more favourable for them um, so yeah it's, it's nice to kind of have an optimistic note that maybe 2020 could be better um, but but we'll see time will tell <laughs> yeah. so we're in very reflective reflective mood as we look at the end of uh, 2020 we're going to uh, 2019 <laughs> Got that uh, we're going to take it to uh, the most logical conclusion because of course it is not just the end of a year it's the end of a decade and uh in part two, we'll be joined by uh, Max Kingsley Jones, and we'll be taking a look at some of the bigger trends that have impacted the decade. You can stay up to date with all the best content from the airline business team at thenewlookflightglobal.com.
It, it started with the tremendous shock from the global financial crisis and just before that from this big spike in oil prices. I think that really woke up management uh, to focus on, um, you know, being much more focused on return on capital, using balance sheets uh, more effective. And I think we saw the industry becoming much more rational. Um, and that, I think, has sort of transformed performance in some regions and for a, a certain group of, of airlines. So I think that's a sort of lesson for the future. Um, but we've still got a long way, a long way to go. So that was Brian Pierce, Chief Economist at IATA. I caught up with him um, last week in Geneva when they were presenting their financial forecast and just got a bit of an outlook in terms of, uh, or perspective in terms of how the industry has changed for airlines. Because, you know, when we start looking at what, I've called them the 2010s. I don't know if that is actually <laughs> their, their, their uh, formal name. The 10s. The 10s? The 10s? The 10s, I like that. Yeah. That'll do. When you look at that era, for, for the airline industry, it is absolutely unheralded because it, it was profitable it was the most profitable decade um by you know a, a distance and especially when you compare it to uh the decade that came before and i think you know with the airline industry is almost now quite a respectable yeah i'm reminded of uh, obviously doug parker american airlines chief saying a couple of years ago that you know it's, the airline may never make a loss again i mean it was you know these are investments be taken seriously suddenly compared with you know, where, where we started the decade. So. Well, absolutely. And, I mean, Max, I'm sure you re you remember from um, uh, the fallout from the financial crisis and so forth, the, the industry, uh, you know, uh, very, very different. And you had U.S. carriers posting, whilst they were going through that Chapter 11 and the various restructuring, the mind-numbingly large number uh, size losses. Yeah, I mean, the, I think they all went Chapter 11 mm. at some point, didn't they? Um, most after 9-11 and uh, one subsequently then there was the, that drove the consolidation of the, of the late 2000s uh, into the shape that we have today. And, in, and, and US carriers, really, I think, really led that. Um, they sort of take the credit, the, the, the majors and the consolidation there for mm. well, seen within the industry. I think even Willie Walsh quite often names che name checks Delta for having... Um, uh, provided some sort of a sense check or business rationale to the industry. Uh, absolutely, when he's not slating them for running Virgin Atlantic, <laughs> of course. But absolutely, the I mean, Delta is very much the uh, the poster boy for the airlines. But Doug Parker, as Lewis mentioned, now he takes a lot of the credit for the for driving that consolidation. US Airways in America West, and um, funny enough, we were we were in interviewing him uh, for a cover interview the day that um, American file for Chapter 11. Mm. I remember uh, a journalist was in there. And so we actually had some on the spur of the moment thoughts from him back, way back then. And who knew that was what was coming down the train, um, that he would uh, you know, drive that consolidation through um, to make uh, move US Airways and American Airlines together. So, yeah, it's, um, there's several key players. Delta continues to be the, um, you know, the standout operator, doesn't it, in, in the sector. I think uh, you, you're seeing that consolidated picture is is um, it's really interesting what's happened. I mean, I think you could argue uh, uh, the North American market, almost everyone, there's been a general um, upfill there or, or, or rising tide. Almost every car uh, airline appears to have grown. And even someone like United Airlines, which was uh, punished by the market quite a lot for, for lagging and, and having... Um, you know, taking a slightly different approach compared to their their, their peers, mm. it, you know they were still, <laughs> still yeah. you know, profitability that carriers in. Yeah. in uh, well, you look at how um, <laughs> when looking at the U.S. industry from afar now, you kind of you when you see a negative story about one of the big U.S. players, you you, you actually look at the detail and think, blimey, that's really you having to dig down into the weeds to say, yeah, this massive profit isn't quite as huge as it probably could have been a lot of the time mm. so it's it's astonishing really how strong they are some people would argue too strong of course that's an interesting <laughs> angle to look at it from it's it's going to consolidate to the point now where you've got it's a, it's a tough market to get into but if you think about other regions of the world i don't think many would be um, most of them pretty envious of it's literally first world problems in. isn't it it, is, it yeah, distorts it really is. the market because mm. you look at the global industry i ought to put the numbers out and it looks very very buoyant. Obviously, mm. the numbers are down a little bit this year, but the overall picture is actually very distorted. We've got these big, 
big profits in certain regions and then other parts of the world there's you know real struggles going on and I think mm. that's the point you were making isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah that's right. and, and you know we're, we're always you know become very obsessed by Europe being in Europe <laughs> that's obviously the, the market we know best but the, the European market I think is, is fascinating in terms of consolidation I think when you you look back at the start of the decade you had you know these bigger airline groups starting to emerge Air France KLM mm. IAG Lufthansa starting its its kind of development and of those uh, I mean you, Air France it's a sort of a reminder of the work Air France KLM has to do because mm. that actually is still roughly the same size or the same you know that hasn't enlarged in a way that um, uh, someone like IAG which which has added even a Europa to its uh, roster. Yeah, I think the um, one difference that stands out actually, again, going just looking back at the US, you have um, relatively small penetration by the low cost carriers. When you look at Europe, mm. um, the the big players, like you say, Air France, KLM, obviously it's got its own problems internally, but certainly the competitive environment has been slightly different. I guess because they haven't over the last ten years had that kind of sudden really strong consolidation into these groups they've kind of started maybe from a slightly more defensive position and then we've seen EasyJet Ryanair really encroach on their territory so I, I would kind of quantify it. I guess you've seen the US a real consolidation the US that Europe's kind of somewhere in between the other regions where it's kind of moving towards maybe something along those lines but whether it really can truly reach that level is, is the question and I think you'll hear um, Michael O'Leary you know now saying you know few years time it'll be five groups so similar to the US maybe with five key players in Europe but equally a lot of people say that the market just doesn't lend itself to that in Europe so it's an interesting and, interesting dynamic and I think that it is, it, I think the other interesting thing the US if the US majors I mean everyone uh, you know over the last 20 years or so has had a go all the major carriers have had a go at a, a budget brand a low-cost brand and you know mm. we can all remember the the goes the song um, jazz Ted Ted, Ted. Yeah. Um, uh, I sort of I once did a quiz of made up ones and real ones and I can't really remember which ones I made up now <laughs> but um, it, but actually what's it's interesting because I think in in of the the US majors actually they've they've managed to find a way of segmenting within their own mm. structure within under their own brand mm. um but actually, within Europe, you have seen, you know, so within IAG, Vueling is a low-cost brand, Level is a low-cost mm. brand, um, Lufthansa obviously has developed its Eurowings, mm. and, and Air France KLM, a, a Transavia, you could... Um, yeah, it feels you, like they're kind of, the, those European groups have, in contrast to America, like you say, they've, they've been, it's been a defensive response to that encroachment, whereas in the US, they've been able to, they kind of got that position of strength before any low-cost carriers have been able to kind of um, inconveniently uh, start trying to, to, to compete with them. Um, so, yeah, they've had their attempts at their own versions, but they haven't really needed it because they've, you know, they've got those um, strong I think domestic the, networks. The European low-cost landscape has been an interesting one to watch over mm. the last 10 years because I think if you'd asked people in 2011, 2012 whether you'd see full-service carriers, even if it was their brand, their sub-brand, operating um, strongly still in Europe... Uh, you would expect not, but it, the reality is that here we are, about to turn to 2020, and we still have Lufthansa, British Airways, mm. Iberia, Air France operating. They've tried all different things. They managed to keep, uh, you, you know, we haven't seen all that rolling over to become a Ryanair, EasyJet, um, turf war between those two. They obviously have their own big sectors. The market's grown, mm. and everyone's managed to, um, to to keep competing. Whether that will change in the next 10 years is a big question, actually. Mm. It'll be yeah. interesting to see how that plays out. But is it? Sorry. Yeah, no, just uh, an obvious thing to bring up at that point is the low-cost long-haul attempts at that. So we, we've seen, mm. um, particularly um, Europe's been a logical place for people to try and build that business. You know, Norwegian, as you mentioned, level, and um, which is obviously within one of the, the big groups. But um, I guess the reason, we'll probably to call it, the failure of, of attempts to introduce that, I guess, has helped those network carriers keep their positions of strength in, in those markets. But um, yeah. I, th I think the other interesting thing is that is the the pace of pressure, and it's quite interesting. There's um, uh, uh, Max, you are our, our, our fleet wizard, and you've got some numbers at your fingertips there. The, but it's quite interesting when you look at the pace of, of development of a Ryanair uh, this in pure aircraft numbers mm. compared to, say, a British Airways or an Air France, and the growth is is, is staggering, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, I can refer to my notes. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've ruined the magic. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I haven't, haven't memorised all this. Yeah. Um, Ryanair was on about 200 aircraft uh, this time 10 years ago, and they now have uh, 420 aircraft, so doubled. British Airways uh, was 240 aircraft, mainline, and now to r- around 280, so not moved much. Air France hasn't moved at all. Mm. They've gone from uh, 266 to... Um, trying to find them on my list, uh, 224. So they've actually cons- consolidated slightly. But obviously there's been a lot of other stuff going on in the background. The interesting thing on on the ranking, if you look at the, the, the top 20 airline fleets over the last, since 2009 and today, uh, the US consolidation really shows up because you've got the, the biggest fleet today is American Airlines with about a th- just under 1,000 aircraft, closely followed by Delta uh, in the 900 to 1,000 unit mark. They were the, uh, American was the biggest airline 10 years ago but they were only on 600 because obviously they weren't consolidated, nor was Delta. Mm. The Northwest merger hadn't quite happened then. So the, the consolidation has just made the strong grow more strong, even stronger. I think the other, um, you know, and they've undoubtedly been the story of, uh, undoubtedly, but they've clearly been one of the key stories of uh, the decade of, of the big Gulf carriers. But actually, I suppose they end the... Uh, they end the decade slightly subdued, unusually, unusually so. I mean, seen huge growth at Etihad, at mm. Emirates, and at, at Qatar, um, but all for differing reasons. Are they're, they're you know they're major players. They're still, mm. but they're they're uh, they're sort of placed on the global stage. Is just sort of um, stagnated a bit, I guess. Yeah, they, well, they weren't in the top twenty. In two thousand and nine, mm. were which uh, illustrates yeah. just how how far mm. they are now, based on fleet mm. and fleet fleet unit size. And um, Emirates is number fourteen in the top twenty uh, as of now, two hundred and seventy aircraft. Qatar, two hundred and twenty roughly. So you know they've moved up the up the rankings, but as you say, they certainly Emirates is consolidating as we've talked about on previous podcasts. The fleet growth is very much pegged now. Uh, what they do have on order is almost certainly going to replace most of what's flying today. You're not going to see massive growth as we have seen in the past. And it's all about making maximising you. I mean, they would always argue it's always about that, but I think more so now than projecting power that it probably was a few years ago. And the third um, irritant in the market, if you like, Etihad Airways is, is you know restructuring. And so uh, that's affecting the whole strategy in the Gulf as well, I think. But I guess we, uh, the, the other thing to say about them, of course, because they have such small home markets that their, um, their presence is that much higher on the global scale because almost by definition everything they do is global mm-hmm. and impacts other, um, other, other parts of the world. Um, Asia is a slightly different picture, isn't it? I suppose we've, the, the yeah. Japanese, the, the big two Japanese carriers after uh, restructuring at um, Ajao have, have had good, um, been pretty profitable and the Chinese carriers as well. Mm-hmm. But again, that's a very fragmented market. That, that's the key thing. You sort of like, yeah, a lot of consolidations happen in the US, Europe, kind of getting there. Um, look to Asia. Yeah, it's it, again, as you say, very f- fragmented. You know, success stories. They seem to be a lot more kind of government-owned carriers as well that have held positions of strength um, up to a point. So we've seen less um, encroachment from low-cost carriers. You, you look at Japan. I guess there's a market where that's starting to happen now. So I guess. Um, over the next 10 years, it'll be interesting to see where that leaves the the, the, it's, the big players. Um, and South Korea as well, of course. Where, where, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, India, I think, uh, when you look at a market over a decade, India mm. is probably the most, most interesting. So, I mean, uh, we going into the decade, you might have thought of... Uh, well, Air India and its yeah. uh, and its privatisation. Well, oddly, that hasn't happened. Um, Jess Airways, Kingfisher might have been seen as the <laughs> as the new kid on the block. I, I Is don't there think. Still, <laughs> yes. still, still acting. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think. I don't think anybody would have been saying the biggest car in India would be Indigo, and the next, you know, the most prominent and sort of lively people like SpiceJet and GoAir and mm. stuff. And I think. When we look at that, the the role of the low cost coast low, yeah. low cost market, yeah. I think there's a way you can argue that in, in India it is going to skip. It's almost going to skip any kind of. Yeah. Um, it's going to skip a move, and it's just going to go straight to a period where the low cost car segment is, you know, a, a, a large chunk of of the market, mm. um, and, and sort of maybe miss out this stage of carriers trying various attempts to to deal with it. Yeah, and whereas in China you have, uh, I guess, um, uh, 
what we've seen is obviously the rapid growth of the, the, the Chinese airline industry in line with the, the rapid economic growth there. But it's tended, it's obviously centred around the, the big kind of China, Air China, China Southern, China Eastern, all you know, government owned to an extent. So it's difficult to judge the dynamics of that market too far. But it's certainly one where they are leading that growth. And it's near, in contrast to India, where you, as you say, it feels like they've skipped almost a generation there. It's um, China. There are low-cost carriers there, but again, they have tend to have links with the bigger carriers in some cases. It's, it's difficult to judge um, that market in general, but certainly it's it's one where the, the kind of big network players tend, tend to dominate. And the other region that's probably it's important to, to mention would be uh, Latin America. Um, Again, there's been, uh, certainly towards the end of the decade, there's obviously some really interesting developments with the US carriers getting involved there, LATAM, Delta, situation with Gold. Um, but it's a market where um, I think it's a constant source of frustration for operators there. They think they've made progress and then they, they're kind of knocked back by a new government. It's a very fragmented market, so they look on to Europe, for example, with a lot of envy over where, how there's kind of a single market in terms of being able to own airlines across the region for example that kind of thing um, so latin america i'd say uh, it's probably a decade of frustration and you feel that when you when you go there you go to the outer events for example you know everyone knows there's huge potential but it, it's um it's one where um the question is always will it be allowed to to play out and you know Bra no better example than brazil where where it's you know one of the biggest economies in the world but um but there's, you know, it's a relatively tiny airline presence there. So, again, there's a story of potential, but frustrations around, around fulfilling it, basically. So there you go. That's our whistle-stop tour of what's happened in airlines over the, <laughs> over the last 10 years. In part three, we're going to have to take a quick look at a couple of the other major trends which have really shaped this uh, decade. You can stay up to date with all the best content from the airline business team at the new look, flightglobal.com. Welcome back, and um, part three with one of the other key factors. I think we've, um, which have, which is really a story of uh, of what shaped airline development over the, over the past decade is is fleet fleet development, and I, I guess we've seen a sort of almost unprecedented amount of activity in that field, haven't we? Well, yeah. I mean, we've seen delivery rates going up and up and up to points where uh, we thought we'd hit the, the new maximum, and then the records get broken every year. Obviously, this year is a strange one because of the max situation, but the the overall picture has been one of slightly disorganised growth amongst the OEMs. I spoke to Tom Williams uh, just after he retired, who was the uh, basically production manager at Airbus, amongst many other things, on the executive board, and he sort of said, you know when someone looks at how we build aeroplanes from outside, from another industry, you wouldn't do it the way they do it because he said we never planned to be building 60-odd you know, single aisles a month. We kept going, oh, we need to just get another five more or a ten more, going from 20 to 25 to 30. So you kept looking for the easiest, quickest way to do it. So we've kind of muddled our way up to that le level where we're, we're building 1,500-plus aircraft a year, mainly single aisles, but obviously some wide bodies as well. And that's be, you know, reflected in the orders, it's reflected in the fleet growth. It's uh, it's quite interesting because I think you you keep kept expecting airlines to sort of stop ordering uh, ahead because eventually, you say, oh, all the order books have filled up for the next mm -hmm. three years. So you think no one needs to order any more aircraft, but they they keep doing it. Mm -hmm. There's this sort of like endless pressure to oh, hang on, we we don't have our our fleet plans nailed down for you know eight years time it's a sort of strange perpetuating thing yeah yeah it's um yeah very true and i, I think one of the rare exceptions actually i was talking to air baltic recently and um, they, he was uh, the ceo martin gauss was actually saying there is a ceiling to the number of aircraft that could serve you know the, the baltic baltic states and um it's very unusual to hear someone saying that because as you say you will look to some airlines where you think well that's not a huge market but they've got 200 you know, um, A three twenties on order or whatever. So yeah, and but it does yeah, it does seem to be never ending. We've had a few peaks, obviously with huge Dubai air shows, for example, with lots of orders. But but they still trickle through, and um, I guess they have to go somewhere. So <laughs> well, the earliest you can get an Airbus single aisle, according to the CEO at the Dubai show, is late twenty twenty four now. Mm. Um, which which if you're if you're an airline who thinks, I'll tell you what, the max is grounded. I can go and get a, uh, you know, if you're Airbus, I can get, a, I can get a nice mm. bit of capital and bargain here. I can get uh, nick some Boeing Max customers. Actually, <laughs> you well, can't. Airbus, is, you know, they're having to sit on their hands because they, it, 
they, they say you know they say all the nice things oh we don't want to take advantage of another OEM's bad situation but the reality is business is business and if Bo- if Airbus could see opportunities to um, to flip Boeing customers he used mm-hmm. to delight the now retired super salesman John Leahy to do that he absolutely hated it when it was the other way around so he'd love to get his own back but Airbus are kind of stuck they're, they're in the sort of some drying cement because they can't give you I mean apart from the odd slot that might be available in the next couple of years um, they're, they're full mm. 2025 really is the, the realistic first opening and I think um when, when you think about fleet and some of the, the big developments, it's easy to sort of forget um, about the A380, you know, which mm. was this huge, obviously huge, but also huge uh, uh, shift in, in the approach. And basically, you know, this bet between whether airlines, you know, capacity constraints, which I'm not aware capacity constraints have got any better <laughs> at airports. I don't think there's any more capacity. Yeah. But I guess the idea was um, that airlines would need you know, flying more hub to hub, um, and then there'd be a bit more regional flying, I guess, against Boeing, and it's, you know, if it drove the 787, this whole um, point-to-point element, and I guess point-to-point one out? Yeah, I mean, we could do a whole podcast, a whole thesis on the success and failure of the 380. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is it, it won the battle, uh, which was the battle with the 747, and it kind of effectively ended commercial production of the 747 which is kind of one of its uh, objectives when Airbus launched it in 2000 but it lost the war to smaller aircraft mainly the the, uh, 777 actually the the problem Airbus have faced is that when they conceived the A380 uh, which was actually a long time ago now it was the late 90s they they very much saw the the jumbo the jumbo jet that we all know and love as the benchmark for operating cost analysis Uh, it had the lowest um, seat mile costs of any aircraft because it was so big. Airbus went for 10%, I think, at least below that, and I think they pretty much nailed that. But by the time the aeroplane arrived, the 380, the, the, the goalposts had moved. The aircraft that you had to match was a 777-300ER, had the range, had the performance, and most, most importantly, it had the competitive uh, operating costs, and then that was made worse by the arrival of the 787. So I think that really explains why the, the production will end in about a year or so's time, and there will have been 250 ish aircraft delivered against a forecast to think of well Airbus always used to say 1500 aircraft but we know realistically they were looking at sort of 700 around around 700 or so aircraft over 20 years so yeah um, not a happy story but uh, it's been a fascinating fascinating one to um, r- report on and, and cover for all of us over the last uh, decade and a half and I think the the, the other thing I've, I, that strikes me about airline airline fleets over the past decade or, or the shift in strategy and it, and it ties into this this idea that airlines are getting bigger you have these more consolidated groups but but now this idea of of a, operating a single type i i wonder if we're sort of moving away from that a bit or whether we, we got to the size of of fleets where people actually the economies of scale of operating a single aircraft type kind of no longer apply and i, I you know i would use as my evidence that ryanair when it threw louder uh, through its louder division is even Ryanair, who were the uh, the doctrinal kings of single fleet, are you know see the benefit of having a second aircraft type, which I guess is all about. It would be useful to have competition in tenders. It's always the ultimate irony that OEMs spend so much time and effort certificating uh, common type ratings or same type ratings, so that the pilots can turn up one day and fly um, a single aisle the next day without much training costs get into a twin island and fly it you know one day flying london edinburgh the next day flying london vancouver and then the, the oems com- sorry the airlines then completely ignore all that and then they buy 7879s and 7810s and a35900s and very similar size and performance so it's all about the market it's also about the risk i mean particularly we've seen that now with the max you know southwest probably wishes it hadn't spent its whole life buying or modern <laughs> life, anyway, buying 737s. So I think that's also going to probably play into future strategies as well. I think the other the, the other interesting thing about the future strategies when we talk about it, and it's undoubtedly driven, um, you know, a lot of the order activity we've seen over over recent uh, the recent years is the role the environment plays in this and addressing addressing that. Um, now clearly, there's a financial imperative for airlines to renew and improve its fleet with more fuel efficient things there's an operational gain from that mm. but environment has been a factor in that and and it's going to continue to be isn't it i think so yeah what we've seen and um 
the, the, the CEOs I've spoken to in the last few months um, in Europe, particularly, and this is a um, the, the environmental pressure is, I think, has been felt most acutely in Europe, um, certainly in the, the past few months. But they all acknowledge that suddenly an issue that was always always there has suddenly shot up the agenda to the point now where it's almost the first thing they're they're being asked about. And you know, for example, the A4E um, uh, European Airlines lobby group. Um, talking to them recently, and sustainability is now top of their agenda that they're meeting early next year. Um, that will be the, the key talking point. So um, it's not exactly from nowhere, but certainly um, outside factors have suddenly made this the, the big more, issue. More for than everybody. just a biofuel flight they need to do. It, that it was, is. The old days. Yeah. That, <laughs> that was. Yeah, yeah that took yeah. the box for, for 12 months, didn't it? Yeah. We, we um, don't have bio. <laughs> yes. Um, but what's interesting is uh, how... Because of how quickly this has happened, I think you're seeing a variety of responses to it playing out. So in some cases, we've got Wizz Air, Ryanair, you know, suddenly putting out documents saying we're the greenest airlines in Europe. You know, it's bad. Don't don't fly business class. That's terrible for the environment. But equally, the network carriers will say, well, hang on a minute, but all these uh, low cost airlines are flying between destinations where you don't necessarily need to fly. So um, and you know, there's so many different ways you can measure um, your own efficiency, and then. Of course, I think the logical thing is there probably needs to be an industry-wide response because I don't think many people outside the industry are going to be are going to be um, caring too much about this kind of tit for tat battle between individual airlines. And Calen played yeah. it blinder, didn't it? With they, its, um, think the, responsibly about that, flying. Do that, you really that need that to fly? Great, yeah. I mean, you think lo- logically it doesn't work, but actually it's it's a mm. great line, isn't it? Because it's the it's the yeah. please please drink responsibly. Yeah. <laughs> I think smoking they, can damage your health. <laughs> exactly. I think they saw very. You know, well done to them in mm. a way they, they saw that no one had done that yet so it was kind of actually if we get in there quickly with this message um, and they did it very well as there was a, I think the key thing was there was an optimistic message with it which is actually we get this right and flying is a great thing it's it's so um, uh, which undoubtedly um, it is but um, but th- the challenge is yeah you know how, how this plays it's out. also the messaging isn't it Lewis I mean you've mm. talked about this many times um, it almost reminds me of the cigarette industry not that I was old enough to understand at the time but watching the history about the you know the, the tobacco industry in the 1960s this kind of denial mm. r- recall you know rec- sort of research to prove that cigarettes weren't bad for your health mm. and it's a bit like that now the airlines have moved from that denial stage what would you say yeah i think yeah. some of them have yeah i think again that the, the, because it's happened so quickly um certainly in europe it, it's um um yeah, there is still, I think, an instinct among some people to be slightly defensive. And I think you clearly want to defend the industry, but you don't want, in doing that, to come across as as being defensive. That is a tough kind of... What, um, it? what about the others yeah. kind of... Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. you hear that, so um, I won't name <laughs> another CEO I was talking to recently, but it's like, well, hang on a minute, look at um, shipping. That's mm. uh, 4 to 5% of, of global emissions, and uh, aviation's only 2 to 3 So why does no one, you know talk about that but i don't know that's just, you know, what about it it's not going to get you anywhere um i think people do and i think quite quickly they probably will mature their view and as as i think i are to and others develop a kind of uh, a more optimistic and and kind of you know, widely agreed um messaging i think we will see some improvement and it's so visual isn't it i mean you mm. on a clear blue sky day you're out in the yeah. high park or you know, Central Park, and you see a vapor trail go over, mm. and that you know that's not emissions as such, but people see that and they can point straight to that as look at the look at the, s- the smoke coming out of that airplane. Exactly, yeah. and, I, and, and I was really I was really struck as well because uh, uh, obviously f- flying and environment are on the political envi- uh, political radar. Particularly, you know, clearly we are talking about um, particular countries in Europe where it is is particularly high, and these kind of this kind of pressure is not felt from other parts around it, mm. parts, parts of the world in the same way necessarily. But we've seen in the, I've, I found it really interesting in the in the UK elections that you have, you have it, you know, in mo- something about um, tackling aviation's impact and flying in in political manifestos, and actually it being politicised. So you you know this idea about tackling frequent flyer programmes. As address is addressing almost like a socialist. It's a socialist take on mm. how do you tackle the environment. Um, so we, mu- you know, we must hit these, uh, you know, these evil frequent flyer mm. frequent flyers who are travelling for all these uh, these benefits. It's it's yeah. it's an interesting further twist. You know, I yeah. think that that the narrative around it 
however fast airlines move, mm. it is it's evolving so so quickly. It is really difficult to stay on top of. It is, and I think that is why. Yeah, you talk to most European CEOs, and they will. That that, that is why it shot up their agenda because they see things like that. You know, um, you know, going after frequent flyers. Like you say, if you're suddenly taxing um, frequent flyer benefits, blah blah blah. You know, that that's you know kind of could be a game changer for for a lot of carriers. So, and as we talked about in Europe, there are a lot of carriers who aren't you know massively profitable they are kind of always living on the edge a bit so anything that knocks them over you know more taxes and that is why it's so important that the industry gets the message right and it's going to have to get its house in order pretty quickly on that messaging i would say going back to fleets you know we hear a lot of ceos that quite rightly will say well we're investing all this money in in new aircraft the only i think the only slight limitation with that argument is that that investment was made a long Sort of that beginning of that investment was was a fairly long time ago. These aren't aircraft that are kind of brand new into the industry. They've been talked about for years. So I think you know claiming that they did it all for environmental reasons because they love love the planet and um, it is I don't know how far that's, that's going to wash that well with with the wider public. Even though it is a it's going to form part of the narrative, but but like met so many factors, it's not enough on its own. I don't think. So. So pl- more than enough to look forward to uh, 2020 mm. and the decade to come. I he- think I hear the sleigh bells of Santa <laughs> calling. It's the, uh, mm. I have to remember this is our special festive edition. We didn't <laughs> talk about Max's costume, did we? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> the full elf. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the full elf outfit. It's very gr- good of you. Do you like the green? It suits me. It does. Very much yeah. so. <laughs> Hopefully, I think Boeing, uh, not making light of the terrible tragedy that played out with the Max, I think what Boeing will be really hoping for in the next 12 months is to see some clarity on what it's going to do about NMA. Um, we talked about the last decade, and I joked off air that we've probably been talking about the NMA for, for the whole, almost, it feels like almost the whole decade in some shape or form. And that's probably the first big um, bit of news we're going to see in terms of aircraft development, I think, in the, in the early 20s. Does Boeing do the NMA? If it doesn't do it, what does it do instead? Maybe it does a new single aisle. Um, but I think that's the one that we'll be waiting to see um, some movement. Airbus at the moment are fairly settled in what they're doing we know pretty much where their product development's going but boeing's got a lot of questions it's facing it's definitely one to watch for next year max lewis thank you so that's all for this time you can find links to the stories we referenced including our analysis of iata's industry profit outlook in the podcast notes and you can keep up to date with all our review and forecast content over the coming days at the new look flightglobal.com if you've enjoyed this podcast please leave a review And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. In the meantime, have a happy holiday period, a great new year, and we'll see you again in 2020.